Hi students, this is our final lesson in personality development and we're going to focus on the theories of the social cognitivist in this lesson. This is the one that I resonate with the most closely, maybe because it's the most recent, but also because there is a clear path where you can actually tie it to personality development. It's it's less mystical and unscientific and woo woo and there are other things that are kind of more clear cut where you can prove that things in childhood actually manifest themselves in adulthood. So for me, the social cognitivist theory is more relatable in personality development. However, that doesn't mean that all the others. Well, actually the trait theory is a big one for me too. It doesn't mean that I don't find value in Freud and the Neo-Freudians. They're wild and I love talking about them, but these are ones where there is more concrete evidence of personality development. That is just my personal bias. So you make the final decision on your own and see which ones resonate with you. We're going to start our talk with John B. Watson. Now Watson is not at all recent. This was 1920s. Watson claimed that external forces, not internal, not our own cognitive thoughts, that external influences are the traits of our inner conflict, largely shaped by people's preferences and behavior. In the 30s, his approach was taken up by B.F. Skinner. Skinner agreed that we should pay more attention to observable behavior and pay attention to how organisms behave and avoid trying to see what's going on in their mind. Skinner also emphasized the effects of reinforcement on behavior. We've learned about reinforcement before, so those things that are going to repeat a behavior. When we take the theory of behaviorism and apply it to socialization, we assume that our desires originate within us. But Watson and Skinner largely said, no, that's not true. They discard personal ideas of personal freedom, choice, self-direction, and say that it's, it's all due to the reinforcement that we achieve when we are in childhood stages. We look for parental approval. We look for customs. We are conditioned and shaped into wanting some things and not the other. And socialization is this process of learning socially desirable behaviors of the particular culture, and then we adopt them as part of our personality, according to behaviorism and B.F. Skinner. In his 1948 novel, Walden II, Skinner described a utopian, or the ideal society in which people are happy and content because every member of the society contributes to and receives the benefits of the society. They've been socialized from an early childhood to help the people of the society at large. Because of the childhood socialization, people in the fictional community want to be decent, kind, and unselfish. They see their actions as a result of their own free will. According to Skinner, however, no one really has free will. We think of ourselves as being free because we go after the things that we want and we get it. But Skinner said that society shapes us into wanting what is good for society at an early age. <sighs> Wild. The social cognitive theory is masterminded by Albert Bandura. While Skinner emphasized the behavior, the observable behavior, Albert Bandura, if you remember from the Bobald doll experiments, partnered with his Richard Walters colleague. He argued that personality is acquired not only by direct reinforcement, but also by observational learning and or imitation. Think of your own lives. How did you learn how to shoot a layup? How did you learn how to tie your shoes? You probably were taught it by somebody doing it with you and then expecting you to do it with them. Social cognitivists emphasize the individual acting within the environment. They emphasize the mental processes where behaviorism did not do that. Behaviorists are focusing only on an observable behavior. Social cognitivists, it's got the word cognition in it. It's about thinking. So how do we think about the way that you and I interact in the world? Cognitive and personal factors include those things like traits, beliefs, expectations, things we have prior knowledge about interacting with behaviors, and then within the environment. So we actually have a role in ingesting that stuff and then becoming a part of our personality. This is very useful in predicting future behavior if we consider the actions of our past. Social cognitivists will explore people and how they interact with situations. In order to predict behavior, they'll look at past scenarios. For example, here's one. In World War II, the U.S. Army, rather than taking a personality test or some sort of assessment, 
Army psychologists subjected the candidates for spy school to undercover conditions. They tested their ability to handle stress, to solve problems, to maintain leadership, and to withstand intense interrogation tactics. Although this was time consuming and expensive, they found it more realistic than taking a paper and pencil test and determining whether or not a person was actually going to be a successful spy. Social cognitivists believe the best means of predicting future behavior is neither a personality test nor interviewer's intuition. It's rather checking on a person's past experience and, and behaviors in personal situations. This way, we can tell more about a person's personality. One of my favorite Albert Bandura terms is self-efficacy, especially in relationship with learning because it is key to learning. A person with high self-efficacy Efficacy believes in their own abilities to succeed. They believe that if they set a goal, they're going to get to it. This is tied to self-esteem because a person with high self-esteem is going to strongly agree with self-affirming questionnaire statements like I'm fun to be with or I have good ideas. And a low self-esteem person responds to these statements with less than positive results. People with high self-esteem feel good about themselves. They get fewer sleepless nights, whereas those with lower self-esteem may be shy and anxious and maybe a little lonely. High self-esteem is going to shake off their bad moods. They know that they deserve better, whereas low self-esteem, low self-efficacy is going to have a harder time with that. Experiments have shown the effects of low self-esteem that when researchers temporarily deflated people's self-image, now they wouldn't do that without some debrief, you know, that would be unethical. They're more likely to disparage others or to express heightened racial prejudice. So in other studies, people who are neg more negative about themselves also tended to be oversensitive and judgmental. People made to feel insecure often become ex excessively critical as if to impress others with their own brilliance. Self-efficacy is an important concept in our self-behavior because it governs our behaviors in our abilities to succeed. You get to decide whether or not you're going to be successful or not. And that leads to the development of success. As behavior unfolds, you develop expectations. And as they get better and better, you expect more, better and better. So if you believe that you're gonna be a good public speaker, you will be more motivated to study public speaking and do the work that it takes to become a great public speaker. People with high self-efficacy have high expectations and they're also more likely to persist in more difficult tasks. They're going to be the ones who take on the difficult tasks. We have spoken about the humanists and humanist psychology when back when we did the timeline and things like that. The humanists have a more positive viewpoint about personality, personality development, and they came around the 50s, 60s and kind of flipped the script that humans are guided by these biological urges that are mean and nasty and said that humans actually are trying to live their best life, that they're actually awesome. And I believe that's true too. So humanists are ones that resonate with me also because they're more, I call them the touchy feely guys and look at them. They're so cute and cuddly. So Abraham Maslow is a humanist and believe that humans are separated from lower animals because they recognize their own desire to achieve self-actualization. And that is to reach their full potential. And he called his full potential uh, the hierarchy of needs. He believed that people must follow their own paths to self-actualization and that they have free will. He argued that people who stick to what is tried and true may find themselves, themselves living lives that are boring and unpredictable, and so they should try to test themselves. So let's talk more about Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs. As we progress through life, we are trying to become self-actualized. That is live our best self, be our best self, live our best life and reach a level of competency of mastery and value and just be free to do the things we need to do. We start with the bottom of the hierarchy. And if we meet our safety, uh, basic needs, safety needs, love, belonging and esteem needs, then we got what it takes to become the best version of ourself. More on this in class more on Carl Rogers. Now Rogers was an advocate of the humanist approach and believed that people are to some degree the conscious architects, again, the free will of their own personalities. Rogers view people shape their personalities through free choice and action. And this it revolved around a concept known as the person-centered therapy. 
Rogers placed great emphasis on our abilities to create a self-concept, that view of ourself as an individual. He also believed that the self is concerned with recognizing one's values and establishing a sense of one's relationship with people. The self then is the center of each person's experience and an ongoing sense of who and what one is. This provides the experience of being human in the world uh, as its guiding principle. Just being a human in the world is the guided principle behind personality and behavior. Rogers is really cool because he changed therapy. He One thing he did to change therapy was he started calling his patients clients rather than referring to them as patients, which humanized, as a humanist, the experience of therapy. Our self-concepts are made up of our impressions of ourselves and evaluations of adequacy. So being called a, a client rather than a patient puts us on level playing field as the therapist. And Rogers believed that the key to happiness and healthy adjustment is congruence. That is the consistency between one's self-concept and one's experiences. So we're doing the things that we say that we're going to do in order to become congruent. For example, if you consider yourself to be outgoing and friendly, this self-concept will be reinforced if you have good relationships with other people. This will probably lead to feelings of happiness and a sense that your self-concept is accurate. But if you have difficulty getting along with others, there is an inconsistency between your self-concept and the experiences, which will make you feel a little bit troubled or anxious. Further, uh, Rogers assumed that we all develop a need for self-esteem. Self-esteem is the belief in oneself or our self-respect. At first, self-esteem reflects the esteem in which others hold us to, so put upon us. But then parents help children develop their own sense of self-esteem when they show unconditional positive regard. Parents show unconditional positive regard when they accept children as they are, regardless of behavior at the moment. So you got a speeding ticket? Oh, I still love you. Let's round things out with the social cultural approach. So socio cultural approach focuses on the role of ethnicity, gender, and culture in our personality. Culture, like Americans, when asked to complete this statement, I am, they're more likely to respond in the terms of personality traits or occupations, like I am outgoing, I am a teacher. Other countries from other continents in Asia, Africa, South America are more collectivist. America is individual and other cultures are more collectivist. So when they ask a, an Asian culture, I am, they may say I'm a father, I'm Buddhist, I'm Japanese. So they're going to focus more on the family and the community. Americans, we say, I am smart, I am pretty. Uh, we value individual and personal rights. Now, when it comes to gender and sociocultural theory, gender from birth babies are treated differently based on their gender. The interaction of an adult with a baby and children is different from that of uh, depending on the gender of a child. And if you don't believe me, I'll show you some examples in class. Toys that our children are given are traditionally for male or female. Uh, they can be gender specific and different ethnic groups are subjected to discrimination and poverty, uh, which may lead to poor concepts of self-esteem, high self-esteem, low self-esteem. We also have this self-concept thing that is known as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the expectations of a culture for a specific ethnic group can introduce the outward behaviors of that person. Our last term for sociocultural approach is acculturation, which means a process of adapting to a new or different culture. People who immigrate to the U.S. undergo acculturation. So some of you may have done that. If they come from Africa, Asia, or Latin America, they're likely to find that differences in language are just the tip of the iceberg of the things that they have to adjust to. Acculturation can take different patterns. Some can be easily assimilated or absorbed into the culture that they move to. They may stop using both the language and the customs of their country of origin, and others may choose to be separated from the dominant culture. Now, some research shows that those that are bicultural have higher self-esteem while maintaining their own origins and ethnic cultures and adopting others. Then you have a greater sense of belonging, and this may help to determine parts of our personality, Culture definitely, culture, ethnicity, gender, economic status has a role in forming our personality. That's our final lesson for this unit. To review this particular lesson, we talked about the behaviorists, social cognitivists, 
the humanists, actually a lot of information, and finally rounded it out with sociocultural theory. I hope that you have throughout these four lessons learned more about personality and definitely reflect on how you have been shaped throughout the brief moment of time that you've been existing on earth. That's all for now. Thanks so much.